Hello and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program in which we tell the stories of the suffering and persecuted church around the world. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. These were the first words uttered by Father Jude Fernando following the bombing at the St. Anthony Shrine, the national shrine in Colombo, Sri Lanka, where he is the rector. The shrine was one of three churches and three hotels popular with tourists, attacked by a group affiliated with the Islamic State on Easter Sunday, April 21, 2019. The final figures counted 264 dead and over 500 wounded. Today, the islanders are still harboring fear and nursing both physical and psychological wounds. To tell us more, it's my privilege to welcome Father Jude, the rector at the St. Anthony's Shrine in Sri Lanka. Father, thank you for being with us here today in our program. Thank you, Mark, for welcoming me. Father, I would like to go straight to it. Can you tell us what happened on that day? 21st April, Easter Sunday, 2019. I was celebrated Easter Vigil Mass that he night, and I went to bed around 3 o'clock. So we had four Masses on the Sunday, 6, 8 in Tamil, the local language, and 12.15 and evening 5.30 in Singhala. Now, just understand the context, these masses are full. That is, uh, you have a, a very faithful community of Catholics living in Colombo, and these masses are generally, the church is full. Yes, yes, people come all over. Being a shrine, being a house of prayer, people come all over. So these masses are always full. And, and where were you at the moment? You were coming into the church at the moment when the, when the blast took place, or what was the circumstances? If you could just tell us a little bit. It was uh, the Tamil Mass at 8 o'clock, celebrated by visiting priest Father Joy Marie Ratnam from Claritian Congregation. He used to help us in Tamil Masses. So I was about to walk into the church. Uh, it was after, immediately after the renewal of the baptism of the promises. There is a custom that people kneel down uh, for the prayers of the faithful. So it was the last prayers of the faithful. So I was about to walk into the altar uh, for the announcements and the, for the distribution of the communion and to help the priest. Normally, I stand and look at the altar. But at the particular moment, I don't know what happened. I just went and sit down and turn my side to the wall. That was exactly 8.45, the blast. I had never heard a sound like that. So I just, for a moment, I was silent. And then immediately I got up. I went inside the church. I saw to myself on the right hand side the surge of fire and people were screaming, crying and shouting. So I immediately hold the hand of the priest who was celebrating the mass and I took two steps forward and then he told me it's a blast. And then immediately I phoned the cardinal and informed him about the incident. And then I saw to myself as a first witness, what really happened, which I couldn't believe. What was it that you were, what, I mean, you must have been in a state of shock yourself. Certainly, because I saw people died in pieces, the blood everywhere, and people were running, children were shouting, screaming, and then with the support of the priest, my assistant, the people, we tried to evacuate as soon as possible, the casualties to the hospital. And we got the support of the police, Navy, Army, everybody came in to support us. You mentioned that it was the moment of the promises of the baptismal, so people were in a moment of prayer. Certainly. And how important was this moment, in a sense, spiritually? Was there something particular that you felt, now that you look back on it, that there somehow there was something also particular spiritually that was going on. Because on an Easter Sunday, we 
we make our promise by ourselves, renewing, re rejecting the Satan and act, and we promise that we believe God. Immediately after that, it was the prayers of the faithful that we are offering for the church, for the people, for the universal church, for the local church. And that was the time it took place. How do you cope or how do you, how do you manage? For example, now when you go and say mass in the church, in the shrine, are you afraid? I am not afraid, Mark. Even on that day, I was not afraid. I am not afraid to die because I am strong in my faith. They, they would have destroyed our church with bombs, but our faith is more stronger than bombs. They can't destroy our faith. The success of overcoming the situation is the prayer. Celebrating the Eucharist, reciting the Rosary, and visit to the Blessed Sacrament. This is the secret behind every Christian faithful. You cannot destroy. Go back to the history, time of Jesus. People were suffering, persecuting, but they gathered in prayer. They stood in prayer. That was the secret. I'm really proud to say this is my secret. This is my secret. This has a power. You recite, you pray with this, the protection is always there. There is no, there is no weapon uh, so powerful than this. Look at the saints. Padre Pio, St. John Paul II, Mother Teresa, present day saints, they have the secrets. So this is the secret behind. How do you answer the question today when people come and say, how could God allow this to happen to us? My reflection is, they close their eyes. Those 264 people, our own brothers and sisters, to open our eyes to the world. If not, it would have been a disastrous situation in Sri Lanka, in the world. But God chose the lesser evil. They closed their eyes to open our eyes. What do you mean? When this incident took place, it was not a single isolated incident that happened in Sri Lanka. The whole world opened the eyes. The whole world joined their hands together. They all were talking. What happened? Why on an Easter Sunday? How could this happen? Exactly. So my reflection is, God always is a merciful God. He know what is best for us. He made this single evil act to make us strong in our faith and make us come closer to him because he loves us more than anyone else. Are these martyrs for you? They are heroes of the faith. Heroes of the faith. They came to church to pray not to fight. So, Cardinal himself called them as heroes of the faith. Was there a desire for revenge after the bombs, uh, bombing took place? Mark, my first words after the bomb was, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. The words of Jesus on the cross. I don't know from where I got it, but it was pronounced from my heart because nothing against with a community, a Muslim brothers or any other. It's act of terrorism. It's act of terrorism anywhere in the world is a terrorist act. It's a criminal act. Criminal act. But it's nothing against the community because there are brothers and sisters who are close to us the Muslim brothers and sisters. 
still they are coming and visiting and praying at the church. I was going to ask you, has did it divide? Because immediately afterwards there was a curfew that was implemented out of fear, naturally, with the police placed a curfew, no movement of peoples. Did it divide the community you have in, in Sri Lanka, just to clarify, the majority of Buddhist, Christians and Muslim? Was there division? Was there anger against the Muslim community? Uh, but did it divide the, the community? In, how was it in those days and weeks after, after within the community that we're speaking about? It's a very good, very good question, Mark. Because His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit, with divine providence, with divine providence, I use the word divine providence, he took the leadership to control the situation. The whole country listened to him, irrespective of their caste, religion, language. He said, we are one brothers, one sisters of Sri Lanka. Do not take arms. Do not attack anyone, even a slight word. He was strong enough to give that leadership. That made a big difference. On the other hand, what we were preaching along the years, what we were celebrating and praying the mass and our paraliturgical activities really has touched the life of the faithful. So they were able to listen to their good shepherd who asked to be calm. They were able to cope up with the priests and the nuns who were consoling them without taking revenge but calming down themselves and accepting and giving helping hand and loving our brothers and sisters, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, live in peace and harmony. Can one say that these religious communities, as a result of the attack and through the witness of the Christians, I suppose there's two questions. What was the response of the Muslims, particularly the Muslims who were feeling afraid of revenge attacks against their communities, to the witness of the Christians who said no revenge? and Second question, has the community become more united in Sri Lanka, these three religious communities, following the witness of these Christians? Mark, we show to the world we are Christians. Look at the world as such. Who is welcoming the brothers who are affected by war in other parts of the world? It is Christian countries. Look at Europe. You have opened your doors for them to come and settle down. Likewise, in Sri Lanka, we do. Because we are walking a journey. Peace and reconciliation is a journey. It's not an act of a day. We are working for the last 30, 40 years. The church leaders, religious leaders, they come together interreligious dialogue. We have activities together. We have functions together. So we have a sort of a cordial relationship with them. But when you speak with the average Muslim, for example, today, has he been affected, positively affected? Uh, well, positively and negatively, I suppose, in a certain way to reject the violence on one side. And on the other side, when you discuss, when you talk with the average Muslim, has he been touched by the Christian approach to what happened? Certainly. They reject the extremism. They don't want these things because they are living peacefully with us. Even one 14-year-old boy died at my church who came to pray. A Muslim boy? Yes, Muslim boy. Does this happen often where Muslims come to pray in the Christian church, in the yes. Catholic churches? Yes, they come. Even those who wear their, the burqa, they come. After the bomb, they came. We have welcomed them, irrespective of what happened. You set a particular date. Now, to understand a bit the damage, the bomb was so strong that the roof blew off the cathedral. You had no roof left. The doors were blown out, the windows were blown out. You said, 
I'm going to fix this church. I'm going to rebuild this church. And you set a particular day. Can you tell us about what was in your mind when you thought, I want to rebuild this church? It was Easter Sunday, 21st April. The next major event is St. Anthony's Feast. When is that? 13th June. It's a big feast in Colombo. Lacks and lacks people come. Everybody was worried. Church was closed. And they never thought that we will have a feast on 13 June. You had 90 days. 52 days only. 52? 52. 52 days. From 21st April to 13 June, You're 52 right. days. I stand corrected. 52. Thanks to the, the labor and the commitment of Sri Lanka Navy, more than 300 Sri Lanka Navy personnel. Navy personnel. Navy personnel. Day and night, 24 hours, they work to restore the church back to normal entering of the devotees. So, with the permission and the, with the blessing of His Eminence, Malcolm Cardinal Ranji, the Archbishop of Colombo, 12th June, we were able to reconsecrate the church at the presence of a large crowd, Buddhist, Catholic, Hindu, Muslim. And on 13th, we were able to celebrate the feast day mass. And that was a dream of everybody because that gave source of consolation and that gave again the lost faith. God is alive. God is with us. God is for us. You are personally yourself and a group of priests involved in the grief recovery program. What are the different steps that you work through with these families that have lost those so close to them? Immediately after the blast, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit established a special committee task force committee headed by two auxiliary bishops, Bishop J.D. Anthony and Bishop Maxwell, to work out a plan for the recovery process and the healing process. We had four steps. The first, faith journey. So we had a faith animation team, a group of priests, young priests, and the sisters and the lay people who initiated immediately to walk along with the people, faithful, listen to their stories, just be there, celebrating Mass, praying to gain the lost faith because they came to church for prayer and they lost their loved ones. So it was a faith journey. Second step is counseling and trauma counseling. Again, voluntarily, priests, nuns, religious, and the lay leaders came up in numbers to accompany these people. It was a difficult task. When they cry, you have to cry. When they shout, you have to listen because they are pain. And they walk another journey. Third, they lost their breadwinner the head of the family, so their living was lost. So Caritas took initiative to support them in the livelihood activities. And then more than 324 children lost their education, lost their support. So His Eminence took the initiative to help these children giving scholarships and making them a future life for them to live. So they could continue their education. education. So we took these four, four steps and it was a journey. It's not, it was not a, a day activity or a plan something you will finish it off. It was a journey, a difficult journey, but journey with steady grounds because once a month, we meet 
to evaluate ourselves, to see the progress, to see the difficulties, and to take the next steps. So we were marching forward. It was the building of the lives of the people. But when it came to the restoration of the churches, it was the Sri Lanka government, together with Sri Lanka Army and the Sri Lanka Navy personnel, helped us to rebuild the churches. But with the rebuilding of the lives, it's the role of the church. church. How do you heal the healers? How do you not suffer? I mean, you're working with a small group of priests, a small group of sisters who have also been impacted themselves in their lives, in their personal witness, in their testimony. How do you make sure that the healers are also healed? How do they, that they overcome their own trauma? Thanks to aid to the church in need, they wanted to strengthen the hands of the priests, nuns, and the religious because we have never encountered a situation like this. So we are trying, we tried to get down the professionals, the priests and those who are expert in the areas to give talks, seminars and the retreats for us to en enhance ourselves. So you don't encounter burnout. And then to help the others. And on the other hand, Another activity what we did is this faith animation group with the Caritas, they took these victims to north because we had 30 years of war and there are our brothers and sisters who lost their loved ones and they had the experience gone through pain and suffering. So we took these people to the shrine of Our Lady of Madhu which is in the northern North. part of the country, in the yes. Tamil area. North. Yes. And then there is another church, church called Martyr's Church, where our people gave their life for the faith. So when we took these people to those places, when the people of the north shared their experience, lost of the loved ones, and our people came to know, not only we, there are others who have suffered in a different way, in the past, in the present. So we are one in the community. Suffering is part and parcel of our life journey. So that made them kind of a hope or new way of opening for their future. So these kind of activities of exchange has really helped us. I think we have to thank these priests, religious nuns, and the lay leaders who gave and sacrificed their life voluntarily to build the lives of the people. It was a difficult task. How have you seen and felt God's presence? What miracles have you seen, even the small ones, in this time of such great suffering to reassure you that he's still present? A young couple came to me after the blast. She was pregnant on that day. Immediately after blast, she fall, fell down and trampled because people were running after the other. They rushed her to the hospital. Doctors thought, baby is gone because there was no movement at all. And mother also couldn't do anything. After one day, doctors came and told her, baby is alive. This young couple took that baby, miracle baby, to church to give thanks. They said, Father, here is a God, the presence of God. You must have wept so many tears, Father. How do you keep your faith? My secret is, the Eucharist, daily rosary, daily visit to the Blessed Sacrament. Immediately after bomb, I told my assistant, nothing doing. We need to celebrate Mass. We need to recite the rosary. That's where we stand. Even midnight, even early in the morning, he was with me to celebrate the Mass and recite the rosary that made us 
strong in our faith, stand up and up to now, continue the work and we are doing. How can we help you, Father? What can we do? What can those people who are watching the program with us today? My sincere gratitude, prayerful greetings to all the people who stood by with us at the difficult time. You name it, USA, Canada, UK, Germany, Italy, Australia, foreign, Japan, Middle East. Praying with you. Praying with us. Little children send their cards. That's how it means. Even our Christian, non-Christian brothers and sisters, Muslim, Anglican, Methodists, Protestants, Hindus, Muslims, everybody, India, they send their greetings and they are with us. So there is no word for me to express to say thank you. And every day we pray for you because that is the only gift that I can do and I can give back because prayer is a way of communicating our gratitude, our closeness to our brothers and sisters in the world who helped us to overcome the situation. Father Jude, thank you for having been with us today in our program. Thank you, Mark, for giving this opportunity. Pray for us and I will pray for you. Thank you. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today in our program, Where God Weeps. If you'd like to know more about the work of Father Jude, about the situation of Catholics in Sri Lanka, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.